Shalom Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. And this evening, I wanted to take a little bit of time and share with you some very interesting insights uh, from the actual news that we're looking at. And unfortunately, I don't have uh, the, the setup that we're used to where we can see these things on the screen and behind us there. Uh, but I'll, I'll share some of this with you here uh, on the screen, at least the, the links of the different news that I'm looking at here. And one of those news clips is from Sputnik, an article that just came out on Sputnik here uh, on the 2nd of August, uh, entitled, U.S. has no boots on the ground in Syria except the Kurds. Now, I don't know if, if Sputnik is saying this more as a, um, well, what would you call it, being facetious perhaps, because everyone knows that the United States does have boots on the ground inside of Syria. But the point of the article is here is that the U.S. has definitely allied with the Kurds and of course they are pushing uh, for, the, um, for the Kurds to have their own state inside of Syria and that of northwest Iraq. Uh, we have seen this from the fighting that has gone on, on over in Mosul. Uh, how the U.S. really banked the Kurds in taking Mosul along with the Iraqi military, but how the U.S. has really come to the aid of the Kurdish people, giving them heavy weapons and arms in order to gain the control of northern Syria. Now, what's really ironic is I believe that we may have a biblical passage in the book of Hosea that may allude to this very fact, this very... Um, alliance between the United States and the Kurdish people inside of Syria. But of course, what is it for? Why is the United States so interested in the Kurdish people suddenly after um, years of neglect, you might say? Now, of course, during the Iraqi war, it was one of the justifications of President Bush for going in and overthrowing Saddam Hussein was because of the ill treatment of the Kurds in western Iraq. Uh, but all the time during the, f the times where the Kurds have been fighting very successfully to, to stop ISIS uh, under President Obama and even that of President Trump until recently, the Kurds have really kind of been pushed back and pushed under the table and we're not really going to get, be given any autonomy in the region. And I think the only reason that changed is because once the United States saw that they were losing in this war with Syria, trying to topple uh, President Bashar al-Assad, and saw that Russia was getting the upper hand with President Bashar al-Assad and driving out ISIS and all the fighting factions inside of Syria, the United States had to step back and rethink their position. And of course, in order to get that gas pipeline and get the oil from the different parts of the region that they're trying to get, they chose the alliance with the Kurds and began to help them carve out a piece of Syria that would perhaps allow them to reroute the pipeline from Saudi Arabia uh, coming up maybe through the eastern or the western part of Iraq and then through the northern part of Syria. Now, we don't see any plans as of yet that that will be the, the case, but it is clear from some articles that have come out in the past that the United States is working with the Kurds for the sake of the oil uh, that they're able to gather from them. Like in the case of Business Insider here, this article here was back in 2016, uh, put out by, by Reuters, excuse me, just one second here. Uh, and let me share with you a little bit on this. Uh, this article was on October 3rd, 2016, says the U.S. helped clinch an oil deal for Iraqi Kurds to keep the Mosul battle on track. And the article goes into a lot of detail how the U.S. was using the, uh, the Kurds to help try to gain control of Mosul. Of course, we know it never, they never fully got control of Mosul. That's only happened more in recent times here in 2017, not in 2016. But the point was the U.S. was trying to back the Kurds for taking back Mosul and it was all about Iraq oil pipelines freeing them up and getting that oil to the United States. Now oddly enough when we look at this I begin to search the Bible to see so many people talk about the spoil they come to take a spoil uh, but that that actually the scripture that most people think about there applies more to Israel. But I ran across a very interesting scripture, though, in Hosea. And I took the time and I began to read this in chapter 13 and also chapter 14. 
And specifically, I was more interested in, um, we go to Hosea chapter 13, I was more interested in the verse around verse 15 near the bottom of the chapter. And I'm going to read that to you there. And then I'll explain to you what caught my attention. It says here, verse 15, I'll read verse 14 as well. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. Though he be fruitful among his brethren, an east wind shall come. The wind of the Lord shall come up from the wilderness, and his spring shall become dry, and his fountain shall be dried up. He shall spoil the treasures of all pleasant vessels. Now, you might think, well, how does that really sound like the United States, brother? Well, you have to do a little bit of research here. And it actually plays in a part with the entire chapter as well as going into chapter 14. If you back up to the beginning of chapter 13, the very first verse says, When Ephraim spake trembling, he exalted himself in Israel, but when he offended in Baal, he died. And now they sin more and more and have made them molten images of, the, of their silver and idols according to their own understanding, all of it the work of the craftsmen. They say of them, let the men that sacrifice kiss the calves. Now in the case here with Ephraim, many uh, people today, many biblical scholars, not all biblical scholars, but there are many biblical scholars that actually believe that the American people are the descendants of Ephraim. That, and you have those that believe that the uh, that the people from England are also descendants of Ephraim, and some say Ephraim and Manasseh. There's different opinions on that, and I don't say that definitively myself, but I find it interesting in this in line in light of this that. Possibly Ephraim's descendants, who was of the house of Israel that was scattered 780 years before, or 780 BC, roughly in that time frame, that yes, they could have migrated up through uh, Europe and then uh, eventually part of their descendants ending up in the United States. Doesn't mean that all the Americans are the tribe of Ephraim by no means, but my point is, is some of the lost tribes of Israel could have very well ended up in the United States. I'm not saying that it wouldn't be. But notice the, the, the verbiage that's being used here in Hosea chapter 13. He says, but when he offended in Baal, he died. Now, some of the very first believers of the gospel of Yeshua when he came, the gospel of Jesus, was the house of Israel. Remember, he instructed his apostles, go only unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as we read in Isaiah, we find out that the destruction of Damascus will also affect what? Ephraim, or the house of Israel, those early Christians that ended up believing the gospel that lived there. It will affect them. But also if we look at the migration as a possibility of the United States, that of Great Britain and the United States, specifically more of the United States here, then this part about Baal could have a lot to do with 325 A.D. When the, when the early Christians that were believers that were part of the house of Israel, as of course we know there's Gentiles included in this group as well, but I'm just kind of pointing out this part about the house of Ephraim here, how that they could have been part of the bringing together the church and state with the Constant, uh, uh, Constantine uh, and of course the church when they first put this together. And here it says, he offended in Baal. He died. And spiritually, that was the death of those that were believers, the early believers uh, that had believed the message of Yeshua from the preaching of the apostles when they began to form their denomination, which was the Catholic Church, the very roots of the Catholic Church. But notice, though, so it says also in verse 2, And now they sin more and more, and have made them molten images of their silver and idols according to their own understanding. Vatican is full of these types of idols. Could that be what this is speaking of? Could it be that it is actually that these idols is speaking of the house of Israel or Ephraim making these idols through Catholicism of his own understanding? You know, it's like 
Job says, or excuse me, uh, not Job, but um, I believe it is Job actually, or maybe it's uh, Solomon, I forget which one, where it says, lean not to thine own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge the Lord. All right, so as we go down though, and I'll, for the sake of time, we find out that Ephraim just goes into sin. And it gets down to verse, of course, verse 14, verse 15, where he says here, and I will ransom them from the power of the grave, and I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. Though he be fruitful among his brethren, and of course, the United States, Great Britain, both, they have been the most fruitful nations in the world. Notice what it says here. All right? And an east wind shall come. The wind of the Lord shall come up from the wilderness, and his spring shall become dry. And his fountain shall be dried up. He shall spoil the treasures of all pleasant vessels. So he doesn't have what, it, what he needs to keep his own economy going, so he goes to spoiling everybody else's vessels. But here's where it gets interesting. As you read on down, it talks about the death of their, their women and the children, but when you jump into verse, chapter 14, right after these verses here, this is what caught my attention that made me realize perhaps this could be related together. Watch what he starts off here. O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God. For thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. And when he's saying Israel, he's talking about all 12 tribes in this case here because it's still speaking about Ephraim or the northern kingdom, but God is calling back all Israel. But watch what he says. Take with you words and turn to the Lord, say unto him, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously. So will he render the calves of our lips. Now here it is, verse 3. Asher shall not save us. We will not ride upon horses, neither will we say any more to the work of our hands. You are gods, for in thee the fatherless find, findeth mercy. Do you know if you look this up in Hebrew, verse 3, Asher is the Assyrians. They will not save us. In other words, the United States has been warring against all the nations in the Middle East. But they have really gone out of their way to war against the Assyrian people. And what are they doing it for? Well, according to chapter 13, they're doing it in order to take the spoil because they have dried up. The United States has become bankrupt, in other words. We don't, maybe we don't have that much oil reserves any longer. You know, it's just a conjecture. I don't say this is an absolute by no means, but I thought it was kind of interesting, and I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, maybe you pray about it and see how you feel about that as well, but I thought it was kind of interesting because the fact that Assyria, Syria, modern-day Syria, and of course, uh, when you're looking at Assyria, the ancient country of Assyria covers all of modern-day Syria and, of course, northwest Iraq, and that's the very places that they are warring at, and what are they doing? They have the alliance with the Kurds. And it's all, even as the Business Insider points out, if you read the entire article, I, I did take the time to read the article, it's all about the oil. It's about trying to not only get the oil from the lands that are there, but also get the oil from another part of, uh, of uh, the Far East there and bringing it up through Syria. They need to save the money on the construction of the pipeline. This is why they wanted to go through Syria and of course, President Bashar al-Assad wanted to do the deal with Russia and Iran, and that's where the United States is just not very happy. So I thought it was kind of interesting. One other thing in news I want to share with you, though, uh, is this article right here. Uh, not the one there, I apologize here. Let me go, RT here, Trump signs Russian sanctions bill despite clearly unconstitutional provisions. Now that's just troubling. Uh, to see that because here President Trump at the G20 sitting on the sidelines with President Putin supposedly working on a way to restore the relationships with Russia and the United States trying to bring about a peace. You cannot help but wonder if that was just all for show. When you see this here, when the, when the Congress passes a bill to renew sanctions broader sanctions, not just renew, but broader sanctions on Russia. And then President Trump sits down and signs that bill into law. President Putin said today, 
it will not make the relationship between Russia and the United States any better, and it will not do so for a long time. Another one of the uh, diplomats for Russia said, it is now started a trade war with the United States. Others have said even stronger statements that it has also ignited the Cold War uh, from what the United States is doing. It is very troubling indeed. Of course, all these things are troubling indeed. By the way, those of you that are um, coming to the conference there, we do look forward to seeing you this coming weekend. Um, we have had some requests about the itinerary. Uh, the itinerary was uh, not posted on the website. Originally, I thought it was actually on the website, but there were some security concerns of some of the speakers there. So we chose to not put the itinerary on the website there about who's speaking actually when. But of course, as you know, the, the conference is Saturday and Sunday. Starts at 10 a.m. on Saturday. Uh, there will be a couple of speakers in the morning. There will be a two-hour lunch break to give people plenty enough time to come and go. And then there will be, um, the debate will actually be uh, Saturday afternoon. Uh, then Sunday morning, again, we will uh, have several speakers speak. Uh, it'll be continuous. I think there is a small break there, but then it'll, it'll end at 2 p.m. on Sunday. So there again, begins around 9, 30, 10 o'clock Sunday morning. Uh, so as far as the timing, that's the way the timing is there. But just for your own knowledge there, there were some uh, safety concerns that some people had in the conference there that were part of the conference. So they, we chose not to post the itinerary. We wanted to let you know that. Uh, and do keep in mind, we're, uh, at this point, we're not able to refund. If there's some of you that are not able to make it, we apologize for that. Uh, the expenses of the conference is about $1,000 more than what the conference actually has been able to raise. Uh, but if for some reason, by the grace of God, those that are that help, and if you would like to help be a part of that, you can also contribute, be a part, help us bring this conference, um, not only for the, those that will be there, but also to bring it live. Uh, in fact, that cost to bring it live is much, much higher than uh, what we are short on the conference, something that we put together ourselves. So if you would like to be a part of this conference and a part of this ministry, we do definitely need your help in bringing this to you. We are going to try to bring this live on Israeli News Live right here on YouTube. We're trying to get the live stream set up for that. Uh, and we're really hoping to bring an awesome event for you there live both Friday and Saturday, hoping the internet will work to be able to produce that. Uh, but go to our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org. You can contribute there uh, to help us bring this to you and bring it to you live as well as on our YouTube channel here. If you're on Israeli News Live, make sure you're on Israeli News Live YouTube channel. Check it out there. You can uh, donate right there above the subscribe button as a donation bar there as well. Thank you. God bless you. We love you and hope to see you this coming weekend. Shalom.